All right, thank you very much, uh, everybody, for coming. And this talk, so last year I gave a talk, if anybody remembers, about uh, something like why you don't want to be a fat burner or whatever. And that was kind of like a controversial talk. And so to follow that up, uh, maybe a more controversial talk, and specifically I heard people saying sh uh, sugar causes insulin resistance, which I think is uh, incorrect. So, and the form format that this talk is going to be in is, uh, if anybody's familiar with an Oxford-style debate, uh, of course I'm just one person, but um, how it works usually is there's two sides and everybody comes in either being for or against the, um, the uh, what's it called, resolution. And uh, whoever changes more minds wins. So if 70% of the people are for the resolution and at the end it's just 50% people and, and there's a 20% change towards that direction, then the against would win and vice versa. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make the case that insulin causes, or sugar causes insulin resistance uh, kind of quickly because most people know that case fairly well. I'm going to try to do a fair uh, assessment of it and then counter that case and then ask everybody that you mentally take a note of whether you're for that resolution or against it now, and then at the end whether you're for or against it, and then I'll ask, like, raise your hand if you were for it and you're still for it or for it against or whatever. Um, so uh, that's what I'm, uh, here we go. <laughs> so the resolution is uh, resolved, sugar causes insulin resistance. And don't be too picky with the semantics, sugar, right, sucrose, fructose, maybe even to some people, glucose and lactose and all that other stuff. And insulin resistance, um, everything from like molecular biology to maybe like type 2 diabetes and metabolic syndrome, that's the loose resolution uh, as I'd like it to be defined. So make a mental note of how you feel about that resolution, and we'll go from there. Okay, so the four position. All right, sugar causes insulin resistance. Uh, it would seem that sugar causes insulin resistance. Um, and I'll go from a big picture perspective to a smaller picture perspective. So the epidemiology, this is um, taken from Stefan Guyanet's website, and it shows sugar consumption um, from 1822 to 2005. Uh, it went up a lot, obviously, especially, um, you know, at certain times it, it jumped up and at certain times it went up a little bit more slowly. But you can see that it basically went up the whole time and alongside that, this is, uh, this is a slightly different time scale. So this is starting at 1820. So cut this graph in half, more or less. And you've got this one starting from 1958 and going to 2009. And this is uh, diabetes uh, diagnosis in the US population on a percentage and a total number basis. So these match up pretty well. Um, and this graph, uh, also taken from Stefan Guyanet, this whole thing is derivative of Stefan Guyanet, this whole talk. I've, he's, he's the pinnacle, so every, everything I talk about is derivative of, uh, of Guyanet. Um, so this shows that it's not really macronutrient intake that's changed, right? This sugar consumption has gone up in the 20th century, but if you look at carbohydrate consumption, it sort of bounces around, it actually goes down in the middle of the 20th century and then pops back up again. Um, so, you know, starch went down and then it was replaced by sugar. But it hasn't gone up the way sugar has gone up. Um, and one of the ways that people say, uh, one of the reasons this happened is that you can really cram sugar into processed foods very easily. So just looking at one thing like a soda, right? There's uh, nine teaspoons of sugar per can of soda. Some people drink like, I know when I was 11 or 12, maybe five to seven cans of soda a day. Um, and so that's as much sugar as I know, as uh, two and a half donuts. So this is like a donut from like Wikipedia definition of, of what a donut is and how much sugar it has. Um, so you can really cram in a lot of sugar and that's one of the ways that the cal caloric intake of sugar has gone up so uh, quickly. And specifically, so in that teenager group, um, added sugars, uh, perhaps as much as 15.6% of their caloric intake uh, in that group, and then it's a little bit less for the other groups, but it's over 10% for all of them. Uh, so that, that's the epidemiology, like flyover picture of what's happened to the consumption, and then, of course, the diabetes rate has gone up, um, which I'll use as a definitional proxy for insulin resistance. Uh, 
at the level of physiology, here's just the regular pancreas um, glucose metabolism and insulin and glucagon regulation double loop uh, model. And if you have uh, a greater sugar intake, you'll need higher insulinemia to maintain euglycemia. It's a pretty simple mechanism. And if you do have this higher insulinemia chronically, you downregulate insulin receptor, just like everything else, insulin receptors have uh, a negative feedback system. And yeah, the pancreas will work harder and harder and harder. Uh, and there's a certain point at which it can't work harder anymore, and that's where you start to get uncontrolled uh, diabetes, where you have to start taking exogenous insulin because your pancreas can't keep up with the uh, glycemic load. At the liver, so that's mostly uh, a glucose and a fructose story, but at the liver, things are a little bit differently. So fructose, unlike glucose, if anybody remembers like the big fructose Robert Lustig thing, it has this pernicious different type of metabolism where it doesn't really get taken up by uh, all the cells equally. It's preferentially taken up by the liver. It's less insulin dependent, and a lot of it can go into liver fat production. So it skips, uh, it gets thrown into glycolysis at a, a level past where glucose gets thrown in, so it's less regulated. It gets taken up very rapidly, and as much as 25% uh, of de novo lipogenesis can be caused just by this fructose intake. And a lot of this de novo lipogenesis, uh, if in a certain context, can end up being liver fat, um, so like non-alcoholic fatty liver uh, syndrome, and that in and of itself is associated independently with insulin resistance and metabolic syndrome. At the level of the adipose, so just going, uh, uh, also a simple model, sugar uh, raises your blood sugar. So that's a very simple link, um, which raise, then goes on to raise insulin, uh, which then causes fatty acid uptake in the adipocytes. So everybody knows you, know, you need insulin in order for fatty acids to go into the adipocytes and be taken up. Um, as stored triglyceride there in lipid droplets. And at a certain point of these uh, adipocytes taking up more and more fatty acids and growing more and more, um, researchers a long time ago found that uh, there was these macrophages getting uh, in the interstitial tissue of uh, adipocytes. And what they would start doing is becoming active in secreting all kinds of cytokines, these inflammatory proteins that are uh, pretty much directly causal of insulin resistance. So that's where the peripheral inflammation story comes from. And moving on to experimentation. So in mice, uh, this is just one experiment. Uh, there's a million of them like this. But taking a, a controlled diet, no sugar, versus a, in this case, it's only 13% kilocalories from sugar. But you can see that the fasting insulin is much higher in the mice that are fed sugar. Um, a difference of, so you have to understand mice are a little bit differently. So 228 milligrams per deciliter is kind of normal for a mouse. That's crazy for a human. So they're not all diabetic. But, <laughs> uh, and of course, these higher sugar animals also got fatter, uh, and they got fatter eating less food. So their feeding efficiency was much higher. Um, and this is just one uh, representative human experiment. So, um, having either glucose or fructose uh, supplemented into a bunch of people's diets. And the people who were given um, fructose versus glucose have, the, at the end of the study, fi higher fasting glucose and fasting insulin, uh, which just combine together mathematically into a uh, lower insulin sensitivity index, which is just a, it's a mathematical relationship of those two things. And of course, they have more of that de novo lipogenesis, um, specifically eight or so percent more after the uh, end of this um, particular assay here. Okay, so with human experimentation, that is the end of my sugar causes insulin resistance for, uh, so I hope everybody's absorbed that information. And now I'm going to become sugar does not cause insulin resistance. Uh, person. So, um, what if I told you that sugar doesn't cause insulin resistance? Uh, okay, back to epidemiology. So, a lot of these things are just going to be the exact same slides, but I'm going to say the opposite thing. So, get ready for that. 
<laughs> um, so here's the same slide, uh, same source and everything. And I just want to bring attention to uh, something that you might have missed on this slide, which is that little blip at the end. So there's blips all over. Um, but I, I want to bring your attention to that one and zoom in a little bit. So this is also, like I said, it's all from Guy and A. Uh, this is also from his website. Um, forget about that obesity line, but just focus on the sugar. What happened is uh, sugar consumption, in, at least in the United States, um, probably Western in general, uh, peaked around the year 2000 and has actually been decreasing uh, since then and has gone back to like maybe 1990s levels. So we're, we're, we're in the 90s, uh, <laughs> back in the 90s. I'm sure everybody's happy about that with their nostalgia uh, videos on the internet. So um, however, so we're back to 1990 levels of uh, sugar consumption, but going back to this graph, there is no, um, so you would be looking at the double zero on the bottom there is year 2000, and this goes until 2015. There's no pause or, uh, or even moreover what you'd expect, like a reduction in um, cases of diabetes or any of these other metabolic syndrome diagnoses to correspond with that uh, decrease in sugar consumption. So the diabetes incidence has just continued to go up as if uh, it was following the same track as the intake of sugar before. So that's a little suspicious. Um, and this is an international graph. You probably can't see too many of the countries here. Now, the R squared value is 0.359, which is okay. There's definitely a linear relationship between, on the bottom, per capita sugar consumption and then diabetes uh, prevalence. But if you look at the individual countries, it, it wouldn't be unreasonable for somebody to say there's something different between, say, Sweden and Malaysia. So they're on the same uh, part of the x-axis for sugar intake, whereas one of them is very low, uh, below the line on the diabetes prevalence, and one is far above. It wouldn't be unreasonable to say, I think that there's differences between these countries that are causing them to be at different parts on that graph that uh, are not their sugar intake, and that perhaps are more important than their sugar intake. Um, ease of overconsumption. So remember, Coca-Cola is much uh, sugar as two and a half donuts, but what is actually in those donuts? So again, this is a Wikipedia donut, your average donut, and there is a lot of sugar, 11 grams of sugar, which is half the carbohydrate, but look at the fat, 11 grams of fat. Um, and everybody knows there's more, more than twice as many kilocalories per gram in fat, so you end up with a little bit more of the calories from fat as from carbohydrate in general, and then more than twice as much as for sugar. Um, and so the point is, outside of straight up sugary candy and sugary beverages, uh, it's, it's easy to overconsume fat too, if you consider that something you're overconsuming. You can consume a lot of it in junk food, just uh, the same as sugar. Uh, going back to the pancreas question, so again, remember the sugar increases uh, glycemia, which has to increase insulinemia to keep up with that, to dispose of that sugar and that that persistent increased insulinemia can downregulate the insulin receptor system itself, which is completely true. So these are uh, pancreatic cells that are incubated in a uh, insulin receptor. They're just you know, incubated with or without insulin, um, and then their insulin receptors are measured afterwards. And it does go down. So in the farthest left panel there, going from 10 to the negative 8 to ne 10 to the negative 6, so that's 100 times increase in the insulin that these things are incubated in, the percentage of insulin receptor that it decreases is 10%. Uh, so that's not like a huge difference. And if you think about it, that's actually a proof that the insulin receptors and the whole system is insulin sensitive because the downregulation system of insulin and insulin receptor or any ligand in its receptor requires that the ligand binds to its receptor and has some sort of downstream signaling that then causes the cell to produce less mRNA of that receptor or translate less of it into protein or degrade it faster or something like that. And uh, that's, that's one of the ways that insulin signaling can be decreased, but it sort of presupposes that the cells are sensitive to insulin. If they weren't sensitive to insulin, they would just keep producing insulin receptors regardless of how much insulin they were uh, incubated with or in the body, how much was circulating. 
um, at the liver. So this is the de novo lipogenesis causing uh, perhaps fatty liver or just producing a lot of fatty acids that might make their way to adipocytes story. And this 25% number looks pretty big. But, um, and it looks big on a percentage basis. Uh, but really, if, at the most generous level, um, maybe as much as 5% of fructose is uh, converted into fatty acids that make their way into triglycerides, um, which ends up being, if you're consuming like a normal American diet, maybe 1%, uh, calorically speaking, of the amount of fat that you consume. So at, at like the highest de novo lipogenesis from fructose consumption level that you could achieve, you'd be contributing to maybe 1% of the fatty acids that you're taking in dietarily. So it doesn't seem um, super significant. And furthermore, those fatty acids are overwhelmingly saturated, mostly palmitic acid, stearic acid, I think a little bit of oleic acid. So outside of coconut oil, there's really not a better um, dietary source of saturated fat other than fructose. If you're into saturated fat, that is. Okay, so, uh, and then at the level of adipose, um, it's true that insulin definitely causes fatty acid uptake, and when you have a system that has a lot of fatty, a, a large adipocyte depots, an, an obese person, there's often macrophage infiltration and these uh, cytokine production that you can find locally or systemically, and which does indeed cause insulin resistance. But what causes the macrophage infiltration, and specifically for the macrophages to adopt the phenotype where they secrete the most inflammatory cytokines, is secretion of fatty acids from the adipocytes. So if you think of uh, these adipocytes taking up fatty acids in an insulinemic environment, so insulin is stuffing fatty acids into them, for fatty acids to be secreted out of them that recruit these macrophages, you need a low insulin environment. So it's actually the opposite of insulin signaling from sugar, which makes sense because if you have adequate glucose or sugar, you do not want to be pulling fatty acids out of the, uh, out of the fat because you don't need them and because insulin is, is storing fat. So this is something that I believe happens more when you have, say, if you had a lot of adipocytes and you were fasting and then you started relying on free fatty acids, that's what starts to recruit macrophages into the adipocyte tissue. All right, moving on to experimentation. So remember this one uh, as a, a mouse experiment, you've got your 13% sugar group, kilocalories from sugar, and your control group with no sugar. But I tricked you, because actually, uh, the group that had 13% of their kilocalories from sugar also had 30% of their calories from triglycerides. So it was a high sugar and high fat group compared to the control group, which was low fat and mostly starch. And this is what you will see in 99% of animal studies if you just go to PubMed and you put in high sugar diet, actually look at the methods and look what they're feeding in order to induce obesity, insulin resistance, or any of these um, symptoms in animals, they always combine sugar with fat. And uh, there are a handful of studies that do not do that and compare directly sugar and fat. So in this study, there's LL, LH, HL, and HH. So L means low and H means high. And the left column means, uh, let's see, fat, thank you. And the right column means sugar. So LL is low fat, low sugar, LH is low fat, high sugar, HL is high fat, low sugar, and HH is high in both of them. All right, does everybody remember that? So, uh, and this is the effects of those four diets on um, two strains of mice. The A slash J mice are regular mice, and the B slash 6J mice are uh, the same type of mice, but they're genetically prone to things like type 2 diabetes and obesity a little bit more. So if you look there, the low, low, so the mice that are given, you know, kind of their normal starchy diet, uh, in both the A slash J and the uh, 6J mice, they have um, lower glucose and uh, insulin, fasting glucose and insulin, than the uh, high fat, high sugar animals. But the low fat, high sugar animals, especially in the 6J mice, actually have lower plasma glucose and plasma insulin than the high fat, 
low sugar animals and the low fat low sugar animals. So uh, the sugar basically is having their of a less metabolic syndrome phenotype than even the low fat low sugar, which you know the researchers would consider the one that would be best. Uh, for human experimentation, I couldn't even find a decent study, uh, a recent one that just put people on a high sugar diet with low fat. That's just not done. Um, but what, what does exist is this really super old study from 1938 uh, from a group that's related to the group that discovered essential fatty acids, the BRRRRs, and they wanted to see if they could induce a fatty acid deficiency in humans. So they took one of their um, research assistants and they forced him to eat. <laughs> Everybody knows about you know, lab, grad students, research assistants. Uh, so it's always been that way. Um, <laughs> So this diet, uh, wh what would you expect from this diet? So sucrose provided the bulk of the carbohydrate allowance. Um, and this is a zero fat diet, so the bulk of the caloric allowance. Uh, it was also um, defatted milk, uh, some type of um, biscuit made from starch with like fat-free whatever. Less than two grams of fat per day, which for a human is essentially nothing. Um, 2,500 calories per day for a 152-pound man, so it's pretty, you know, decent amount of calories. Um, and so it starts to talk about what, what happened to this guy, and th this is just a proof of concept paper, so they didn't actually go through and like give him a uh, glucose sensitivity or an insulin sensitivity or glucose disposal assay. I don't even think those things existed back then. But they say his blood chemistry stayed the same. Uh, he lost weight. So again, he's eating pretty much sugar and starch and nothing else, and, and protein, defatted uh, dairy protein. He lost like over 10 pounds. Um, he remained clinically well, they said, and he had sort of like a chronic fatigue condition that went away, and also migraines that he had had since a, a child went away, and strangely enough, have never recurred. Uh, and here's where they talk about his uh, feeling of fatigue at the end of the day's work. Um, and they, they actually have a little point here where whether the sedative or slightly toxic effect of the ketone bodies accumulating in the tissues as a result of the latter type of diet is responsible for this effect is, uh, is a question that they're asking, which uh, people don't look at that too much anymore. The, the ketone bodies are considered a different type of thing now. Um, okay, so. So that is the sugar does not cause insulin resistance uh, argument. So restating the resolution, resolved. Sugar causes insulin resistance. Now, if you were for that resolution and are now against that resolution, raise your hand. <laughs> okay, like one person. Um, if you were against that resolution and are now for that resolution, raise your hand. That should be nobody. <laughs> um, if you were for that resolution and maintained to be for that resolution, raise your hand. Okay, so that's me everyone now. <laughs> uh, and if you were already against that resolution and have continued to be against the resolution, raise your hand. Okay, all right, okay. So most people did not change their mind. Um, however, it looks like one or two people changed resolution from pro to against, which means that I win the Oxford style debate <laughs> with myself. <laughs> um, I would have, uh, if, you know, in case you don't realize, I would have won either way. All right, five minutes up. So now I have um, some, some bonus slides. So what does cause insulin resistance? And here, so a lot of this is a semantic question. Um, like, what does that really mean, cause? And I want to focus here on what's been demonstrated in the lab to cause insulin resistance at a molecular level, like cause resistance to the binding of insulin uh, to sensitive cells with insulin receptors versus something that's speculated or assumed based on epidemiological data or um, like whole body meta uh, metabolic or anatomical data. Um, so one thing that causes insulin resistance in the sense that it causes more insulin to have to be present in order to use uh, the same amount of glucose is just simply using fatty acids as fuel. So if, um, 
somebody's in the hospital and they're on like parenteral nutrition or intravenous, you can dial up and down insulin uh, sensitivity just by increasing fatty acids in that mixture. Um, so this is called the Randall cycle and it's just a basic substrate uh, competition between uh, glucose or any sugar that ends up getting thrown into the glucose type of burning and fatty acids, um, which is totally normal. Uh, in times when you have a lot of fat, you want to spare your glucose, and in times when you have a lot of glucose, you want to spare your fat. Makes sense. Um, but another thing happens when you are primarily running on fat as fuel, uh, the counter-regulatory hormones, which also makes sense. Um, specifically, uh, cortisol growth hormone, that's one people don't think about a lot. It could be called insulin resistance hormone, just as likely. And the catecholamines, which are a more acute effect. But they, uh, they act to directly um, phosphorylate insulin receptor, and more so insulin receptor substrate, which is the primary effect of how insulin resistance is caused, is it gets phosphorylated by serine. And, gets in the way of the downstream signaling from insulin binding to its receptor. Um, so the counter-regulatory hormones, when you are in a hypoglycemic state, uh, cause insulin resistance, which again, makes sense, because if you're in a hypoglycemic state, you don't want to be rapidly using a lot of glucose. Um, and then one that is less talked about, but I think might be uh, the most important, is um, endotoxin. So lipopolysaccharide produced by uh, gram-negative bacteria, and this is just uh, some data taken from a study comparing uh, high-fat fed animals with animals that are just given injections of lipopolysaccharide and showing that the high-fat diet uh, brings in endotoxin into their system. It's, uh, it stabilizes the endotoxin being brought in through the enterocytes, and that this uh, causes uh, pl plasma insulin to increase in order to dispose of glucose that's present because of the insulin resistance of the cytokines that are produced by macrophages in response to this endotoxin. And if you look at this big mass, just focus on the insulin receptor and the uh, lipopolysaccharide has basically the same effect as the counter-regulatory hormones, which is that it supposedly binds to this receptor called toll-like receptor 4, TLR4. And um, one of the effects of that receptor uh, being liganded is to also serine phosphorylate the insulin receptor substrate, which messes with the whole downstream signaling of insulin itself, which also makes sense uh, in the sense that if you had an infection, that you wouldn't necessarily want to be using glucose in the same way as when you do not have an infection. And one minute left. Perfect. That's it. Thank you very much, everybody. And I will take, hopefully, a lot of interesting questions. Thank you. I had a hard time figuring out where to raise my hand because I, the belief I came in with is, is that maybe there's a pathway in which sugar can cause insulin resistance, but that it's not the only pathway and that high fat can also cause insulin resistance. And um, especially when I saw your slides at the end about the different possible ways that insulin resistance can be caused, I'm wondering if it's worth distinguishing different types of insulin resistance and how benign or uh, dangerous they might be um, given different kinds of causes. Yes, or maybe if, if there is something to the idea that sugar could cause insulin resistance uh, in one pathway and fat could in another pathway and the combination might cause it both ways, um, it, could it be the case that one of those ways is more dangerous than the other or does it just matter what the end result is? Um, so is this working? Yeah, okay. Uh, so just d don't think that uh, sugar causes insulin resistance at all um, and that it's misunderstood. So this last slide here, um, I think what happens is people see that they, uh, if somebody's on a high sugar diet or somebody consumes sugar, and then they will have like chronically high uh, and insulinemia. And um, 
and that the sugar exposes. I see. So <laughs> I'll repeat the answer. <laughs> I, I, I think what you're saying is that the insulin resistance was already there. The high sugar um, shows what happens it, when the insulin resistance is there, and that's when, the, that's when it becomes pathological. If you um, remove the sugar, the insulin resistance may still be there, but you won't see any bad effect of it. Thank you for clarifying. So I'll just quick a quick comment before my question is that I noticed that the research assistant was male, and I personally have never met a woman who would have improved mood on a zero fat diet. <laughs> so I just wanted to point that out just from what I've observed. Uh, my, my question then, again going back to what I've observed in myself and many others, you made a quick comment about growth hormone potentially being a factor in insulin resistance, I believe is how you phrase that, uh, except that in therapeutic fasting, which is becoming uh, common and something I used myself, um, we see a rise in growth hormone with a reduction in fasting insulin. Uh -huh. So how is the growth hormone not causing insulin or greater insulin resistance if it's, we're seeing them go opposite directions. So when you're fasting, you are not challenging your insulin, the, the glucose uptake system. So if you have a lot of glu uh, growth hormone floating around because you're fasting, and that does induce secretion of growth hormone, and you're not consuming a lot of glucose or fructose or the combination of, which you're not by definition because you're fasting, then you're, uh, you're not going to have high fasting glucose. But this is something that's seen a lot in like athletes, you know, the whole human growth hormone thing. Uh, a lot of athletes are ending up with like type two diabetes. Um, and it's speculated that that's a, a factor in it, uh, in addition to like that weird belly thing that they get. And um, so insulin resistance is, Again, like it's kind of a semantic thing. Like if you're not challenging the insulin system, you won't see it like a canary in the coal mine, but that doesn't mean, like if you take the canary out, you know, then that you can't just say, oh look, no canaries are dead in the coal mine. Like so the coal mine's safe, safe right. So that, that's the way I look at it. I just wanted to make a comment that I caught the last end of this, but I have to really appreciate the message because there are so many variables. There is no one thing, essentially. I think that's the biggest takeaway for me that causes insulin resistance. And I see this in the clients that I work with where they're going on a ketogenic style diet, but they're still like struggling with insulin resistance. And part of that, like a case that I have, is somebody who has severe chronic insomnia. So cortisol, growth hormone, all of those things are disrupted and it's just metabolic chaos internally is really what's happening. So even though we're stripping carbs and sugars from the diet, she's still not able to balance because there's all those other variables. So you can't, I appreciate the message in that you can't say that it is just sugar or carbohydrates that's causing it because there's so many other factors. I mean, our body does not move or function in a singular manner. There's so many different systems that are connected to it. So it's just, it's 
pure metabolic chaos that's happening. So you have to work on all the different aspects, the variables of it. So have you tried just giving her sugar? Um, I have actually, and that doesn't, <laughs> that doesn't um, work for her either. It actually makes the situation worse. So she's going on now about uh, 20 years of chronic severe insomnia, like has to um, multiple doses of Xanax and different types of sleep aids and still wakes up in the middle of the night. Um, so a lot of environmental toxins, like all kinds of other things that are coming at play with her too. Yeah. Hi, thanks for that talk. That was really great. Um, one of the slides uh, caught me when you showed the, the countries and you said, why would these two countries be different? One point I might make is that they might have different access to medical care because it seems like you pointed out two pretty discrepant countries. But we study, so I'm a professor at UCSF and we study ketogenic diets in randomized controlled trials. Uh -huh. So I was very interested to see, um, see this talk. Um, but the message that I'm also getting from this is whether or not sugar is actually causing the insulin resistance, we in our trials are seeing that removing sugar and putting people on ketogenic diets is reducing the bad things that happen when people have diabetes. So maybe it is arbitrary that we're reducing their A1Cs. Maybe it is arbitrary that their triglycerides are falling in half. But um, regardless, we're reducing the rates at which they're having neuropathy, losing limbs, going blind, all of the bad things that come with diabetes. So I think it's, mm -hmm. I mean, would you say that your position is more about, you're, you're focusing more on the causes, necess not necessarily um, the treatments in this message? Uh, Yes and no. So it, I think it's largely a semantic issue and I just like sort of took issue with people just flippantly saying, oh, sugar causes insulin resistance, like as if out of all the things in biology, sugar blocks its own use in the cell, like <laughs> unlike everything else, right? Like that seems very weird. Um, but and, and yeah, there's clearly some th therapeutic ex uh, success from taking sugar away. but. I would really like to see, you know, how that would stack up against like some different type of therapy, you know, because there's a lot of, you know, underground credence being given to uh, low carb right now, and a lot of people are seeing success, but there's really nothing on the other side, sort of like in the literature, there's no zero fat, really high carb experiments going on. So I'd like to compare the two. Okay. Yeah, that's great. We we did compare it to a low fat diet, like an ADA style low fat diet, but okay. not a, not a zero fat diet. And we did see that the keto diet um, worked better. Okay. Well, there you go.